We're starting today with Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle to the Back Good Night on page 786 in the 11th um, edition. This is a villanelle, that's the poetic form, um, which is discussed at the top of that page. <coughs> it's one of the most difficult poetic forms, at least in English, um, to write because you have lines that get repeated throughout and so you've got to organize everything else in such a way that by repeating those lines everything makes sense. It's composed of six stanzas, okay, five tercets, that is five three-lined um, stanzas and a final quatrain, four lines. The first and third lines of the initial tercet rhyme, okay, and then those are repeated, the rhymes are repeated in each subsequent three-line stanza, and then the final two lines of the quatrain, uh, and then repeat in the final two lines of the quatrain. As your book says, moreover, line one reappears entirely unchanged as lines 6, 12, and 18, and line three reappears as lines 9, 15, and 19. So you actually, in this kind of poem, you don't get a lot of room for variation and introducing new ideas. There's generally pretty much only a line or two in each uh, tercet that you can do that. So let's look at it. I'm gonna read it all through and then we'll take it apart. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end, no dark is right. Because the words are thwart no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late they grieved it on its way, do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death, who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And we'll hold off on the quatrain, we'll get to it in a moment. So, four stanz five stanzas. The first stanza in one sense is kind of general. It introduces this idea of not dying peacefully. And then the second through the fifth stanzas are characterized around, around different kinds of men. So, look at it again. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So good night is obviously what? It's death. Or the night, let me put, that, put it that way. Night is death. Night is symbolic of death throughout all of Western culture but it's a good night. Do not go gentle into that good night. Why is death good? And when you read this poem, because we've already discussed it, you should have in your mind, or, or it should recollect, an opposite idea that we see in John Donne's A Valediction Forbidding Morning at the beginning. As virtuous men pass mildly away, and some say their souls do go, and some say nay, virtuous men die how? Die how? Silently, peacefully. They're not full of rage. They're not full of anger. They do go gentle. I think, I think that Thomas is intentionally going against that idea. I don't know for sure. I think Thomas probably has somewhere in the back of his mind that poem by Dunn. And, and I should throw out, look at his dates. Thomas died young, he was only 39. He died of alcoholism, okay? It's a shame that he died so young because he probably would have produced an amazing body of verse based on uh, what does survive. And I was just reading something uh, in your book mentions that his father was on his deathbed um, when he wrote this, it was published in 52, it was apparently written in 47, okay? So, 
Second stanza. Uh, first stanza. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Why? And, and notice close of day in that, in that line is telling us should come when? Old age. One should die old. One shouldn't die young. I don't know how old his father was. But if this was written in 47, then Thomas was only 33 when he wrote it. More than likely, his father was younger than I am. Which I consider myself old. But if his father was 20 when he was born, much more likely, back in the 19 teens, okay, um, then he would have only been 53 or so. That's young. That is not old age by any means. <clears throat> old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Stanza two now. The wise men at their end, no dark is right. Why? Wise men know at their end, dark is right. Dark, metaphor for night, death, they know death, what does it mean by right? Everyone's got to die, man. That's what it means. Wise men know everyone must die. So, we're told, they know this at their end. The because, in, line, in the second line of that tercet, that's more of a but. Or there's a but implied before that. But because their words had forked no lightning, they do what? They do not go gentle into that good night. So what does that mean about their words not forking any lightning? When do we usually see lightning? See it. Bright sunny day like this? No. Nighttime. Nighttime is when you see Lightning the best. What does lightning do at night? It lights it up. It's brilliant. It's a flash. It doesn't last long. Okay? Why forked? Lightning doesn't usually, when we see it, when it's not just the amorphous flash in the clouds, but when you see bolts of lightning, it is seldom where you see a single streak. Usually there are filaments coming off of it, all right? Because their words had forked no lightning. So how can words fork, create filaments, let's say, of light? Again, these are wise men. These are men, supposedly, if, if we take wise to be synonymous with wisdom, these are men who understand how things work and how things are. What do their words not fork any lightning about or give any light to or understanding of? Light is often a metaphor for perception, like seeing the light, you know, the metaphorical in a cartoon, the light bulb goes off in the cartoon bubble. Used several times throughout the course, the door is a metaphor for what? Death. Their words don't fork any lightning to understanding death. They don't understand it any better than anybody else is what the speaker is saying. And because of that, they do not go gentle into that good night. Why? They're afraid. Good men Notice, wise men aren't necessarily good men. And you can be good and not wise. You can be a quote-unquote simpleton and good. Okay, Good men, the last way by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. What's that the last wave by? Does that mean waving goodbye like this? It might. Or it might mean the last wave of good men. Like 
Okay, this is written 47, um, I was told on a website. What had just ended? World War II. When the Allies invaded France, how did they do that? Okay, you had some paratroopers. That wasn't the big part of the invasion. The big part was how. An amphibious assault where you had wave upon wave upon wave of soldiers rushing ashore, Marines and soldiers rushing ashore. I think it's that kind of wave. And he's talking about the last wave of good men. Part of the implication is that the men that are left behind are not good. They do what? Crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. The dancing in a green bay doesn't mean dancing on the water. It means a bay, you know, so that you have something like this, where this is all shore, here's water. It could be anywhere along there. And it's probably an image of celebration, maybe of some kind of victory. I think there's an, there's an image, for, for some reason, I'm sticking in my mind. There's a work of Greek literature where you have this kind of dancing in a green bay. It might even be like a Dionysian revel, okay? Celebrating the god Dionysius. They do what? Crying how their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Why are their deeds frail? They don't last. Or they've been forgotten. Maybe that's what the last wave by. Don't think World War II, World War I. I mean, men who survived World War I, J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, others who fought World War I talk about this a lot. They remember World War I so, so greatly so horrifically, they dreaded the idea of World War II. They were glad they didn't have to fight in World War II because we're remembering World War I. And so what do they do? Thinking about their frail, in fact, man, that even makes more sense now, because World War I was called what after it was fought? And the war to end all wars. 20 years later, 25 years later, rage, rage against the dying of the light. While I'm going to have to do some more research on this. I've never made, made that connection before to World War I. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late and they greened it on its way. Now. I don't know that Thomas has this in mind, but I can't help but read that line about catching and singing the sun in flight and learning that you grieve it on its way. Because we just talked about it a couple days ago, I'm reminded of Andrew Marvell's To His Queen Mistress in the third stanza where the speaker says, and though we cannot make our sun stand still, yet we will make him run. Right after he talks about Let's tie ourselves all up into a ball to go through the iron gates of life. What is the speaker in Marvell's poem saying? We can't stop the sun, but we can get so sexually involved, we can so intertwine ourselves that we will give him a run for his money. We'll make it as if the sun is standing still by totally blanking out everything else in sex. This speaker says, you can't stop the sun. They tried to catch and sing the sun in flight, and they learned what? They grieved it on its way. And notice, these are wild men. What is implied by wild? Uncontrollable, frenzied. You have to be uncontrollable and frenzied to think you could stop the sun. It's irrational, it doesn't make any sense. So they do what? They do not go gentle into that good night. Final person. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. So what kind of men are these? So we've had 
wise, good, wild, and now grave. Notice the pun, the first four words. Grave men near death. There's a pun there. Death is where you get put, uh, grave is where you get put after death. But what's meant by grave here? Serious, sober-minded. I used the example in my first class, both Barack Obama and Donald Trump chose grave men for their vice presidents. Why? Because neither of them were considered by their parties to be serious enough for the presidency. Obama had only been a senator for two years. Before that, he was a local state senator, not a stepping stone to the presidency. And so he chose Joe Biden, who is supposedly a great foreign policy expert, blah, 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 blah. Donald Trump, no government experience. He chose a man with lots of government experience. Uh, Mike Pence had been a congressman for several years. He'd been executive governor of Indiana for eight years. Okay. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. So what does that mean? They see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Let's start with the last phrase. And be gay and be happy and be joyful, be full of, of uh, happiness. They see with blinding sight, we would probably throw in a that. Blind eyes could blaze like meteors. Well, how do meteors blaze? You see a short burst of light, and then it's gone. Notice they see with blinding sight. That is, the sight there is probably an awareness, an, understand, an understanding, a perception. But the blinding sight does what? It doesn't last long. Those blind eyes, we're told, they blaze for a moment like meteors. In other words, they see. Who have we read about who's like that? Go way back. Oedipus. Thing is, Oedipus can see. It's only when Oedipus, Oedipus puts his eyes out and becomes blind that he really sees. And they do what? They rage, rage against the dying of the light. And in that stanza, I think, most, those lines apply specifically to the grave men. Because what's the dying of the light? It's they're on their deathbed and they immediately understand. And then pfft, they're gone. Now, final quatrain. And you my father, there on the sad height. What's the sad height? Precipice of death, standing on the threshold. But it's like a height, like falling. Why? Because life is supposed to be some kind of ascent, some kind of progression. You're supposed to be better at the end than you were at the beginning because you understand, you grow, etc. You become wise, you become grave, you go through your wildness. No. You, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your tears, I pray. Why? Why does it say curse, bless me? If this poem, and I don't know that it actually is, but it probably is, if this poem is about slash to his father, who is near death, what might the speaker be asking for? When my mom died nearly 10 years ago, she had, had, she had, had Alzheimer's for several years. Um, <clears throat> we were all there in the room when she died, but she wasn't speaking at all. 
when my mother-in-law died last year, um, she was speaking up until I think the day before. It wasn't making much sense, but she was speaking. But the day she died, she was just pretty much, wasn't unconscious, but was asleep the entire time. I think what the speaker is saying is, wake up, say something. Doesn't matter what, why. I just want to hear one more. Eight, curse me. Get out of my face, you rotten, you know. Or, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face, whatever. It doesn't, it is the voice of a child wanting to hear the parent's voice once more. I mean, it's a very poignant poem when you think about it. It's not, it's not only. It's often read as, you got to fight death off to your last breath. It is that. But it's also the cry of a child saying, don't leave me. Don't leave me. Speak. Say something. Give me a final word, so to speak. All right? Go from there to 819. John Dunn, we've read a poem by Dunn before, the valediction for many mornings. Uh, I talked a little bit about Bun Dunn's biography. In 1615, Dunn became an Anglican priest. By 1621, in 1621, he was made what's called the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. The St. Paul's Cathedral that you see in London today, big, massive concrete dome and stuff, that's not the cathedral that Dunn was at. The cathedral Dunn was at was a massive timber building that totally burned down in 1666 when uh, the Great Fire of London burned most of London. Only parts of London today go back to the Middle Ages. Very, very few parts, all right? Uh, the reason I'm pointing that out, you know, Dunn wrote highly erotic poetry. I mean, some of it's just dirty. <laughs> um, but he also wrote devotional poetry like this. He became a great um, preacher, so great, in fact, that... In his day, when he would preach, and he was made, um, at one point, King James made him his private chaplain. So Dunn would deliver sermons just to King James. But when he would deliver sermons in St. Paul's, man, something's going on with my eyes. When he would deliver sermons in St. Paul's, we have anecdotal evidence of this. People talked about it in letters and diaries and things like that. The cathedral would be packed full. So not people just sitting in the pews, standing all around. Some of Dunn's sermons go as long as four and five hours. And people would pack it. It'd be like people today going to Manchester in the summer for Bonnaroo. He was a rock star. Because his sermons were intellectually like full of fireworks. They would go there just to follow the mental gymnastics that he did. Right? So this is one of what's called Dunn's Holy Sonnets. He wrote a total of 19 of these. My dissertation was an edition of these. All right? He originally wrote 12. We don't know when. The dates that are given here are totally irrelevant. They're, they're not necessarily wrong. It's just we don't know when they were written. He originally wrote 12. And then at some point he wrote four more, pulled four of those 12 out, inserted these four, changing the order a little bit. And then at some point later, he rearranged all 16 of those. And then after that, he wrote three more. Those three more never get incorporated into the sequence. They're just kind of always separate. And those three are probably, we're almost positive, were all written after the death of his wife in 1617. So those last three, we can kind of date. This is one of the original 12, all right? Death, it's an it's a, uh, English sonnet. We can tell by the rhyme scheme and the final couplet that rhymes. Death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. 
From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure. Then from thee much more must flow. And soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and soul delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dust with poison, war, and sickness dwell. And poppy or charms can make us sleep as well, and better than thy stroke. Why swell'st thou then? We're going to leave the cup for later. So the speaker is addressing death and tells death, don't be so proud. Proud meaning what? Puffed up attitude or opinion about yourself. Puffed up meaning full of air, blowing hot smoke. Like saying you're the greatest of all time when you're not. Though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. Can I mention, you know, my dissertation was an edition of this poem. I looked at every one of the manuscripts of all of these poems. That meant going to Harvard, New York Public Library, uh, Library Cambridge, Oxford, a couple other places. Actually, there were one or two I did not see in person, but I used microfilms. Some of the manuscripts have death be not proud, period, or exclamation. If the ones with exclamation, it's implied, just shut up. Though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, what? You aren't. I know some have puffed you up. Why? Because you hear all kinds of literature about how powerful death is. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor canst thou kill me. Really? My mom is dead. My dad is dead. I can't go talk to them. I know they are dead. So why does he say, they die not? Because, he says, um, line five, from rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure. Then from thee much more must flow. Rest and sleep, like a nap, or just lying down, relaxing, he says, are pictures of death. If they're pictures, what does that word picture mean? They're images. If they're images of death, then they're not the original, okay? Like the difference between real meat and fake meat. Everybody can tell the difference between the two. And he says, what do we get from the images or the pictures of death? We get much pleasure. Stay awake for a long time. I, told, I always tell my classes for this, as an example of this. When I was an undergraduate, second, undergraduate career. Um, on Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, went to Covenant College, liberal arts Christian school. I would drive back and forth beginning and end of semesters from my home in San Jose, California, heart of Silicon Valley. It's about 26, 2700 miles. I would do that nonstop. Speeding, about 36 hours. Going the speed limit, about 39 hours. No sleep. Okay. When I would finally sleep, I would sleep for a good 10 or 12 hours and wake up very refreshed. That's his idea. So if rest and sleep are images of death, and from rest and sleep we get much pleasure, ergo, how much more pleasure will we get from real death? And soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and souls delivery. Think Hamlet's to be or not to be speech. Before he gets to the part about, you know, you might have bad dreams and that pretends other things, why is he looking forward to death? Slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, proud man's contumely looking down at you, the pangs of despised love, heartache, bodily aches. He says, man, death is a consummation devoutly to be wished. It will end all of that. Dunn is saying the same thing. 
But he doesn't bring up the negatives that Hamlet does. Rest of their bones. Soul's delivery. Soul's delivery, however, introduces an idea that is unorthodox within tradition Christian theology. Unorthodox in the sense that it implies that the body is enslaved in here. That's an ancient Christian heresy. Manichaeism. That says that the, the real thing that's important is the soul, not anything physical. That only spirit is important. Traditional Christian theology says, nope, all this material stuff around us is important too. That's why God says, after each day of creation, it's good, right? Dunn addresses that in a later sonnet. He makes sure throughout the, the full sequence of sonnets, everything is theologically perfect, so to speak, all right? So, he goes on, stanza, uh, excuse me, line nine, talking about death. Here's why death should not be proud. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men. And dust with poison, war, and sickness dwell. Death is a slave to fate. So if it's a slave, then what kind of ultimate authority and power does death have? None. It does the bidding of others. Chance, kings, and desperate men. Who are men who are desperate? Are men who are desperate the high, the powerful one? No. They're the guys who are just barely scraping by, and they have to rob you in order to get money to put food on the table kind of a thing. And he also, death, shouldn't say he, it does what? It dwells with poison, war, and sickness. Really? Are those really the best companions you can have, the best roommates you can get? And poppy or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Now, late 19th, 20, uh, late 20th, 21st century students, I think probably get those, that line and a half better than Dunn's contemporaries would have. What is Poppy referring to? Is this like, you know, uh, the Wizard of Oz smelling the poppies on the yellow brick road? No. What do we get from poppies? Opium, heroin. Poppy or charms, charms is talking about drugs. Can make us sleep as well, in fact, and better than death. If you OD on opium or heroin, what do you do? You die. Unless someone gets you Narcan quickly enough. If you die, the death has gotten you. So how can they kill you better than death's stroke? What happens when you overdose? Are you aware, unless it's intentional, are you aware that you're overdosing? No, you're not. You just drift off to a sleep. How, what would you rather do? Uh, die by fire or just drifting off to sleep? die by bone cancer, extremely painful, or drift off, almost everybody hopes for just drifting off to sleep kind of a thing. Why swellst thou then? The why swellst thou then parallels the opening clause. Death be not proud. Proud is being swollen with yourself. Why are you so swollen with yourself? Then we get the final couplet. One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Several of the manuscripts of this poem read, One short sleep past, we live eternally, not wake. What's the difference between living and waking? Waking is that moment of awareness coming back. It's that moment of consciousness waking up, being made present. Living 
is wise, eyes wide open. Okay? In my dissertation, I suggested that the manuscripts that had lived eternally, I think I did, suggested this. It's been almost 40 years. I don't 100% remember, but I'm pretty sure I said this, is that the live eternally line was Dunn's original thought. And then he revises it later on the way. Or a, scribal, uh, a scribe changes live to wait. Wasn't exactly sure, I don't think. I literally don't remember, okay? And I think that because that principle I wrote over here one day, Lectio Difficile or Putior, the more difficult reading is the more powerful or better, principle of textual criticism. Live, in one sense, is the more difficult reading. From sleeping to waking, that's natural, sleeping to living, it's a little harder because the one short sleep passed, what's the sleep? It's death, live. Okay, so that's a little more difficult. But I was talking to my first class and it kind of dawned on me. I don't think I've ever suggested this before. I now think probably wake is the more difficult reading. Why? One short sleep passed, we wake eternally. Well, Again, done at this time, we don't know again the exact time when the poem is written, but it's in the 16 aughts to early 16 teens. Pretty sure of that. So sometime between probably 1602, 1603, and 1613, maybe something like that. Dunn is very interested in theology. His earliest poems, going back to the 1590s, have theological issues. One of them is, what is the true church? Right? Waking eternally touches on an idea from the New Testament that in the quote-unquote resurrection for Christians, when, when they are resurrected and are with God, it is as if they will be eternally opening their eyes to God, meaning they will be eternally experiencing new and greater and more wonderful things. They will go, as Peter says, from glory to glory. This always eternal revelation. Well, that's waking. Living is going about your daily business, so to speak. And not necessarily having this, this growth period or pattern. We wake eternally and death shall be no more. That is, when we wake up, there will be no more death. Why? Because Awakening is the discarding of death. Death, thou shalt die. Now, I suggested, I think I did, the wise well saw then, in one sense, that's the rhetorical answer to death be not proud. But the death thou shalt die, that's really it. Because the proud part is the swelling up like a fattening of a tick. Dying is what? It's the shriveling, okay? It's the reduction of existence. Go from there to 1048. She walks in beauty. Now I'll go ahead and throw this out now. I'll make a little comment about quizzes and stuff, because I did for the first class. There's a quiz due Sunday night. Pretty sure this is on it, so I'm going to give you an answer. <clears throat> when um, a quiz asks for the author of a poem, like it'll get, there will be a title, give the full name, all right? This guy's name is George Gordon or Lord Byron. Lord Byron is his title. George Gordon is his name. But his name is not, I'm just making sure you get this, his name is not George Byron, nor is it Gordon Byron. It's George Gordon or Lord Byron or George Gordon, comma, Lord Byron, okay? Uh, I've had all those other options thrown in before. 
Similarly, Pied Beauty, poem we read a couple days ago, um, by Gerard Manley Hopkins. His name is Gerard Manley Hopkins. Don't put Gerard Manley, don't put Manley Hopkins. Full name. Um, Ode to the West Wind, Percy Bish Shelley. Not Percy Shelley, not Bish Shelley, okay? The other thing, and I don't think I had as much of a problem with this class as I did with my first class and my Tuesday class. A lot of students apparently think I'm really stupid and that I can't figure out how students cheat, okay? I, I'm pretty adept at figuring out. Here's an example. First quiz. Very first question was, Name the title of the poem by John Updike that was about the death of a family pet. The correct answer is dog's death. And I started noticing, like, I don't know, halfway through grading my first class's um, quizzes, this same wrong answer coming up. Two word wrong answer. Had nothing to do with dog or death, okay? And I was like, where's this coming from? So I pulled up Google, I don't use Google, I use DuckDuckGo, pulled up Google, and I put the full string in. And the full string of the question was dog's death. Okay, and I thought, well, that doesn't work. So I started shortening the string until I finally put in John Updike, poem, death. And it returned the two-word phrase that all of the students, I'm not kidding, literally cross, I think I've done all three classes, out of a total of, 39 students in those three classes, fully a third did that, okay? Um, zero points, it's a 15 point quiz. Zero points, because I just said, because I've had it. I mean, th this has been happening all semester. I'm old fashioned. I still rely on what used to be called honor and integrity. If you want to cheat, you're gonna get caught, you're gonna lose points. Uh, in fact, I've got to go back for my first class and regrade the exams for drama because one of the early questions was, um, what is the literal definition of protagonist? Okay, I'd written it on the board over here. And I said, first or chief sufferer. Well, one of the definitions Google gives is first struggler. Lo and behold, it didn't hit me until I literally got to, like, to the last student. There were probably four, maybe half a dozen, head first struggler, okay? Um, I haven't decided, probably gonna do 10 points off for each instance of cheating on the exam. Anyways, don't, just don't. If you don't know what the answer is, just leave it blank or take a wild guess. If the wild guess turns out to be something that Google has as the first or second, then it's not a wild guess. So, George Gordon, Lord Byron. Um, she walks in beauty. A couple of years ago, I was reading something, and it mentioned, I don't, literally I have no idea what it was I was reading, but it mentioned that this is about a specific woman. This is not just some amorphous, you know, idealized woman like you have in the sonnet tradition. And part of me says, and I know this is wrong, but I'm gonna throw it out there anyways. Part of me says it's about Mary Shelley, um, who I'm almost positive Byron did have an affair with, okay? Byron was friends with Percy Bysshe Shelley and Keats. Byron was the, um, he was the crazy guy among the three. I don't mean crazy loony. I mean, he was into all kinds of kinky, weird sex stuff, and the other two were not quite there, so to speak. But again, that other part of me says, it's not Mary Shelley, it's somebody else, and I can't remember who. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. She walks in beauty. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. Thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, half-half 
had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven dress, or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. And on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, so eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days and goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. So, whoever the she is, notice how she walks in beauty, like simile, the night of cloudless climes and starry skies. Cloudless climes and starry skies. What's the image of? Cloudless climes means nothing obscuring your vision of those skies. Like the Milky Way just laid out ahead of you. I always use the image of, well, the first time my dad and brother and I went backpacking at Yosemite. We, we camped the very first night, about a 13 mile hike the first night. We are literally at the top of a peak, about 10,500 feet. And it was clear as a bell. And it was like somebody had just spread the Milky Way out above us. I mean, billions of stars. That's what he's talking about, right? In all that's best of dark and bright, meet in her aspect and her eyes. So the darkness of the night and the brightness of the stars. So dark and bright, dark and light, mellow to that tender light which heaven to God he day denies. He's talking here and in the next stanza about, I think, this principle. That's an A, by the way. Chiaroscuro. C-H-I-A-R-O-S-C-U-R-O. Which means light and dark. Of the old master painters, of all painters, there is one who utilizes this technique more than anybody else, and it's Rembrandt. Every Rembrandt painting is really all about the use of shadow and light. In fact, there's an element of every Rembrandt painting that photographers also use, and it's called Rembrandt lighting. Whenever you see a portrait or you see a TV show or film, and there's, you know, varied lighting. And on a person's face, you see on one of the cheeks, right here, a triangle of light. That's called Rembrandt lighting. And it's because Rembrandt created or had his subject sit in such a way that when the light shines, it makes one angle, one line of the angle from the nose, Another one from the brow, and you have third tertiary lighting from one side to give just slightly over here so that you get this not bright triangle, but this clear triangle of light on the face. So all that's best notice of dark and light do what? They meet in her aspect and her eyes. Her aspect is her face. There's elements of dark and light there. Thus mellowed to that tender light, which heaven does what? Denies to gaudy day. If you were to look outside right now, there's kind of a tender light because the sun is being obscured by clouds. One shade the more, that is one shadow the more, one ray the less, one beam of light less, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress. What color is her hair? Black. So if her hair had been one shade darker, well, how do you get darker than black? Again, photographers can tell you. You talk about contrast in black and white photography. You want to have in a black and white photograph a pure black and you want to have a pure white. And if everything else is grayscale between those, you want that sharp contrast. One shade the more, one ray the less, would have done what? Would have half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress. There's no name to describe this. Or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dwell 
how dear their dwelling place. That is, her face, we're told, tell us the expression of her thoughts. And the thoughts are, how pure, how dear their dwelling place. That is, her mind. What does her face not reveal? Frowns. It doesn't reveal some crazy smile either. Why? Her mind is at peace. Her mind is totally at peace. And on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent. How can they be soft and calm and yet eloquent? Eloquent doesn't mean you have to use all the words you know. Eloquence can come from silence. The smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tells of day, but tell of days in goodness spent. The smiles that win, that is her smiles that win what? Favor of others. And the tints, the tints in her complexion that glow, they do what? They tell of days spent well in goodness. This woman is being described as like the epitome of innocence. In fact, that line's word's going to be used at the end. A mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. So, a mind at peace with all below. One way to read that might be, that she is not like the proud man who expresses contumely to those beneath him in Hamlet's speech. She is at total peace with everyone beneath her. That's one way of reading it. I think that's wrong. I think the right way is a mind at peace with everything below the mind in her. Meaning, her mind, her, rash, her reason, her rationality, is at peace with her heart, her will, her desires, and her passions. This is a person living in perfect balance, in perfect harmony. Why? Because the love of the heart, a heart whose love is innocent, it's pure. There's nothing selfish about it. There's nothing that desires something for me. Okay. Batter my heart. I think we can do this. We can get close to doing it at least. Uh, 1050. This is the other holy sonnet of John Donne that is always anthologized. Batter my heart, three person God. For you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, overthrow me. And then you're forced to break, blow, burn, and make me new. That is not how that should be read. It should be read, batter my heart, three-person God. What's mean, what does it mean by batter? Like a battering ram breaking down the door of a castle. Why? Because as yet you do what? You knock, breathe, shine, and seek to men. Every one of those before the seek to men is an allusion to a passage of biblical scripture. You as yet but knock, Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He who will let me in, I will dwell with him. Okay? You breathe, Christ breathed upon the holy, upon the apostles, gave them the power of the Holy Spirit to cast out demons, all that kind of stuff. Shine, may the Lord make his face to shine upon you, the greatest of the Old Testament blessings, and seek two men. It is by the knocking, breathing, and shining that God, what? Seeks to mend the broken heart or the broken person. That I may rise and stand. Do what? Overthrow me. How's that for a paradox? If I may, that, that so that I may rise and stand, implies I am what? I'm lying down flat. So in order to... Let me get up. Deck me. And bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. 
Break, blow, burn, make me new is an image of harvesting wheat. Okay? Not just harvesting, but getting the wheat prepared to re-sow. So, what do you do? Take the wheat, you do this, you break the chaff from the kernel, you blow the chaff, the husk and such away, you burn that because it's not any use, and then what? You put that seed back in the ground, Christ says. Unless a seed dies in the ground, it cannot be born anew. The images of breaking and remaking. Create in me a clean heart, O God, David says in Psalm 51. I like to usurp town to another do, labor to admit you, but no to no end. He says, I, another simile, I'm like a usurped town. I do what? I labor to admit you. The to another do, that is, I am due to you. You are the other. But I've been usurped by someone else. And he says, I'm trying to admit you. That's like opening the door before I stand at the door and knock. But to no end, that is to no purpose. I can't. I don't have the power. Why? Reason your viceroy in me. Reason your stand-in. Reason is the godlike quality in, the speaker says, me, should defend me. But it's captive or proves untrue. Reason has been taken captive by the thing usurping me. That's positive. It's weak. Or it's false. I don't mean wrong. I mean reason has become an agent of the enemy that has taken control of me. We'll have to stop there. It's 10.05. We'll pick up it there on um, Monday. We will probably get through uh, the poems through the 19th on Monday. So if you haven't read those, read those. Those are also the poems that are included for the quiz that is due Sunday night. Uh, just a little advanced thing. I'll put up a quiz for the last few poems, probably Monday, maybe Sunday, probably Monday. Um, that'll be due probably Wednesday night. And I will most likely put the final exam up Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. It'll be due like the Sunday before finals week. You won't have to worry anything about this class during finals week, okay? All right, if I haven't graded the exams for this class yet, um, those will get done today or tomorrow.